Hello, good to see you, Pastor Sam, with a devotion for kind of the last chapters of Jeremiah. We're going to be looking at chapters 46, 50, and 51. God is um, pronouncing judgment on specifically Egypt and Babylon, are the two that we're going to be looking at today. Some new things, and kind of uh, the idea is God had used Babylon to do some things, and Babylon was an evil nation that was used by God. And then God is uh, not letting them off the hook. But he's going to uh, use another evil nation to punish that evil nation. So things have a nice kind of uh, cyclical flow to them. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. So we're going to do kind of what we've been doing for the last couple devotions. I've got three sections that we're going to look at. So we really are skipping quite a bit in this last part of Jeremiah. And of course, I encourage you to read it uh, for, for yourself, to read it on your own. We're gonna be looking at kind of some new things that are happening in here. So 46, we're going down to verses 25 through 28. The Lord of hosts, the God of Israel said, Behold, I am bringing punishment upon Ammon of Thebes, and Pharaoh in Egypt, and her gods and her kings, upon Pharaoh and those who trust in him. I will deliver them into the hand of those who seek their life, into the hand of Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, and his officers. Afterward, Egypt shall be inhabited as in the days of old, declares the Lord. But fear not, O Jacob, my servant, nor be dismayed, O Israel, for behold, I will save you from far away and your offspring from the land of their captivity. Jacob shall return and have quiet and ease, and none shall make him afraid. Fear not, O Jacob, my servant, declares the Lord, for I am with you. I will make a full end of all the nations to which I have driven you. But of you I will not make a full end. I will discipline you in just measure, and I will, will by no means leave you unpunished. So what I wanted to look at here is this contrast between what God is going to be doing to Egypt, which is punishing them. And we kind of looked at that last time. The people fled to Egypt. When God warned them directly not to go to Egypt, they still went there. And so God said, what you're trying to escape in Jerusalem is just going to follow you into Egypt. And God is sort of reaffirming that, that uh, Egypt is going to be Maybe not completely destroyed, but at least destroyed. And then it shall be inhabited as in the days of old. So there'll be this destruction in Egypt, and then things will kind of go back to how they were. But the contrast that I want to look at is now God turns to Jacob and Israel, which, which historically is the same person. The Jacob got his name changed to Israel. And so Jacob and Israel sort of refer to God's people. We looked at this, I think, a, like a while ago, that Israel can refer to different things based on the situation because Israel could mean the person who is also called Jacob from uh, kind of the second half of Genesis-ish. Israel could refer to God's people, the people of Israel, the, the totality of them, Israel could refer to, as we get later on in the prophets, the northern ten tribes, the northern kingdom, which called itself Israel, in distinction to Judah, which was just the tribe of Judah, and the teensy tribe of Benjamin. So they kind of got subsumed into the tribe of Judah. Um, and, and so we have to sort of pay attention to what we mean by Israel. Here, especially when we see it, when we see poetry, and you know it's poetry because the lines are all funny. Over here, the lines are fairly standard, but when the lines get all funny, that's an indication of poetry. If we see Jacob and Israel as uh, two couplets, two parts of a couplet in poetry, we understand them to mean the same thing, right? So we have, uh, I guess that's the only part where he has Jacob and Israel together. Fear not, O Jacob. Do not be dismayed, O Israel. When, when the same thing sounds like it's being said twice in a row, that's a common feature of Hebrew poetry, by the way. 
then we understand these to be uh, fairly equivalent. And that Hebrew poetry will say a thing, and then they'll say it slightly differently to kind of reinforce the same thought. So here, Israel just means Jacob, which means the whole people. Anyway, the point is God is going to be bringing them back from their captivity. I will save you from far away, your offspring from the land of captivity. In the midst of God pronouncing judgment upon like every other foreign nation, and there's a lot that we're skipping. There's like 10 pronouncements of judgment. We're just highlighting Egypt and Babylon because they're sort of the major players. But God pronounces judgment on a ton of different people. And in the midst of that, we have this word of comfort and hope for God's people. Right? Fear not, O Jacob, my servant, I am with you. And God is with them here lit, lit, literarily in a literature way, uh, in, a, in a structure of literature way. I don't know how to say that without saying literally. I don't think that's the right word. But anyway, in, in this uh, stylistic format, in the middle of all of these judgments, we have this really hopeful nugget for God's people. I am with you. I am against, God says. I'm against all these other nations, but I am with you. So God is against a lot of things. Today, God is opposed to a lot of what happens in our world, but God is with you. And so that's something to understand. Even as, and, and God doesn't, doesn't do his judgment as directly nowadays as he did then, even, even in the midst of sort of judgments and disasters and things like that, that God is with you. So that's a great thing to just kind of keep and tuck away, right? I will make a full end of all the nations to which I have driven you, but of you, I will not make a full end. That's that remnant idea that we've been talking about and seeing in the past two devotions, that God always keeps a remnant of his people. And here's, here's sort of uh, sometimes an uncomfortable idea for us to think about God. I will discipline you in just measure, and I will by no means leave you unpunished. Now, I like the word discipline much more than I like the word punishment. And we understand poetically they're paralleling the word discipline and punishment. Uh, the word punishment, and, and this is more a feature of our English language than I would say it is of the Hebrew. So I'm not arguing with the text. I'm arguing more with our understanding of the word. The word punishment to me at least, and you may not agree with that, which is fine. To me, the word punishment uh, has kind of a, a, a paying back aspect to it. And, and that's, that's really what I take issue with. If you're punished for a thing, it's trying to kind of make it even. So you stole a thing, you have to pay it back, right? That's the punishment for stealing, right? You stole a thing, you have to pay a fine, let's just say. I don't know if that's actually the punishment for stealing, but it, it's trying to like make it right. And, and that specific aspect I take issue with, God doesn't punish us because when we do something wrong, we don't need to try to make it right. God, God doesn't like take a pound of flesh, so to speak, out of us. He already took the pound of flesh out of Jesus. Jesus paid the punishment for our sin. So all of the collective things that we as humanity have done wrong were punished in Jesus and on Jesus and through Jesus that punishment was taken. So the pun I don't like the word punishment when we talk about things that we've done wrong because Jesus did that. So God's not coming to us to try to make our sins right. Jesus already did that. I do really like the word discipline. And I think that in the Hebrew, the words were much closer than they are today in our English understanding. So again, the failure lies in our English equivalency and in our usage of these words, the failure does not lie in the text and the failure does not lie with God. Let's be very clear about that. But I do like the word discipline. Discipline is not so much paying back the thing I think about the ways in which I discipline my children, discipline is more 
how do we make this behavior go away? How do we make this behavior not happen? How do we disincentivize uh, my kids? Because that's specifically what I'm talking about. How do I disincentivize? How disincentivize my children from doing this thing that is wrong. That's the goal of discipline. Right? I want to make them understand that they can't do this anymore. Discipline, I think, looks more towards the future. It, it is sort of in relation to the thing that has occurred. It's more, I want to reinforce in their minds, when I do this wrong thing, things are going to go badly so, so that we break hopefully the cycle and we just reduce. The goal is to eliminate. The, the, the practical goal is to reduce, uh, but ideally to eliminate poor behavior, bad choices, things that God disagrees with. That's, I, I really like the word discipline. I think for us today as English speakers, the word punishment gets us in the wrong direction. The discipline I like much more. So anyway, here's the weird thought since I've gone off on that tangent. God disciplines us. And this comes up in Hebrews uh, 12, I want to say. Hebrews 12. God disciplines those that he receives as sons. We understand that to be sons and daughters. So God disciplines his children. God wants to correct the behavior. It's not for him about punishing, like you did one thing wrong, now you have to do one thing right. That's not what God is about. God has done that for us in Jesus. So the punishment aspect is, is, is gone, right? There is no more remaining punishment to be like served to us. But God does discipline us. And so you might do something wrong and something happens to you. That's not God paying you back or trying to make it even. That's God putting the thought in your head, hey, when I do this bad thing, stuff goes wrong. Maybe I should just stop doing the bad thing. That's the, that's the idea that God is trying to communicate to you. When you screw things up, things go really badly. Do you get the connection, God is saying? Stop screwing the things up so that things stop going badly. God is trying to get that through our heads with varying levels of success because we're just fairly stubborn people. Discipline. I really like God disciplines us. And the goal is that we would remain his people because we've seen in the book of Jeremiah what God does to his enemies. They don't have a happy ending. If we can remain God's children, things are very good. And that's, that's this section in here. Fear not, I am with you. I will discipline you with the result that I can treat you, continue, continue treating you and having you as my children. I need you to be a certain way, God says. And so I discipline you to keep you as my children because you're trying to go off the wrong way. And I need to bring you back. And, and discipline is one of the ways that God does that. Okay, scooting to chapter 50. So judgment on Babylon. We looked a little bit at the judgment on Egypt. Now we get into the judgment on Babylon. And the next two sections really kind of talk about that. So chapter 50, verses 1 through 5. The word that the Lord... The word that the Lord spoke concerning Babylon, concerning the land of the Chaldeans by Jeremiah the prophet. Declare among the nations and proclaim. Set up a banner and proclaim. Conceal it not and say, Babylon is taken. Bel is put to shame. Merodach is dismayed. Her images are put to shame. Her idols are dismayed. For out of the north a nation has come up against her, which shall make her land a desolation, and none shall dwell in it. Both man and beast shall flee away. In those days and in that time, declares the Lord, the people of Israel and the people of Judah shall come together, weeping as they come, and they shall seek the Lord their God. They shall ask the way to Zion, with faces turned toward it, saying, Come, let us join ourselves to the Lord in an everlasting covenant that will never be forgotten. 
The next section is going to deal more so with uh, the judgment upon Babylon, but what I do want to focus here is verse 3. Out of the north a nation shall come up against her. That would be the Persian nation. Or I think in the next section they are called the Medes, M-E-D-E-S. Um, historically, the Persian Empire rises and destroys the Babylonian Empire. So from a historical perspective, God is at work in the world, accomplishing his purposes through things that look in no way religious. Right? God raises up the Babylonians to, among other things, pronounce judgment upon his own people, the Babylonians being a wicked and idol-filled nation, are also, I shouldn't say are also, are punished by God, and God uses the Persian Empire. God then raises up the Persian Empire to destroy the Babylonian Empire, which he had beforehand raised up to, I'm going to say, discipline his people. So God is at work. And, and nothing about the Babylonian Empire is inherently godly or religious or, or worth no, no salvation is found in Babylon. Maybe that's how I want to say it. But God uses Babylon to accomplish what he wants. And, and kind of the idea that I want to leave you with, we're not done yet, but one of the ideas that I want to impart to you, there we go, is that God can use even the most godless and wicked government for his purposes. It's not an election year but I'll let the point sink in. God can use the most godless and wicked government to accomplish his purposes. I always like, I like being able to say those things. It's, it's kind of fun for me. Okay, now we have, again, Israel and Judah together, meaning we understand them as the same entity. They come to Zion which is another name for, is one of those words that can mean multiple things. Um, can mean Jerusalem, can mean specifically the temple uh, itself. And, and we can understand that in either way, right? Because they say, let us join ourselves to the Lord in an everlasting covenant that will never be forgotten. So probably more the temple itself and not necessarily Jerusalem. But God's people are coming back to him in that everlasting covenant. And this brings us back to earlier in the book, chapters 30 through 33, where we have this little nugget of hope in the midst of like everything going wrong. The everlasting covenant that ultimately pointed to Jesus when we were back in chapters 30 through 33. And you can go back to those if you missed those or forgot those or whatever. Those covenants pointed towards Jesus, then pointing towards uh, eternal life and paradise and those kinds of things. That the everlasting covenant comes when God sends his son to us to provide salvation and to provide the promise of eternal life. Because the, the, the covenants there to four, the, the previous covenants, had been forgotten by the people, had been ruined by the people. But when we see something like everlasting covenant, our, our brains should go straight a ways to Jesus because that's the promise that God has made to us that cannot be broken, right? Trust in Jesus equals eternal life always and forever. There's no, there's no screwing that up, right? I mean, you can stop trusting in Jesus and that'll kind of mess it up, but it's not like Jesus is going to drop the ball as, as we're going along. If, if you trust in Jesus, you have eternal life, period. That's, that's it. Also, if you come to church tomorrow, if you're watching this live, and tomorrow is August 27th, uh, that's kind of what the sermon is going to be. Belief in Jesus equals salvation, period. Okay, I think we're going to move on to the last section. Yep, we're kind of... On track here. Uh, 51. Okay. Make sure I'm in the right chapter here. And you can see that we're skipping quite a bit. I'm not so concerned about that. 
we're kind of hitting the highlights here. So this is um, the utter destruction of Babylon is the chapter heading. Okay, start here. Yeah, he does say the Medes. The Lord has stirred up the spirit of the king of the Medes because his purpose concerning Babylon is to destroy it. For that is the vengeance of the Lord, the vengeance for his temple. Set up a standard against the walls of Babylon, make them strong. Set up watchmen, prepare the ambushes. For the Lord has both planned and done what he spoke concerning the inhabitants of Babylon. O you who dwell by many waters, rich in treasures, your end has come, the thread of your life is cut. The Lord of hosts has sworn by himself, Surely I will fill you with men as many as locusts, and they shall raise the shout of victory over you. It is he who made the earth by his power, who established the world by his wisdom, and his understanding stretched out the heavens. When he utters his voice, there is a tumult of waters in the heavens, and he makes the mist rise from the ends of the earth. He makes lightning for the rain, and he brings forth the wind from his storehouses. Every man is stupid and without knowledge. Every goldsmith is put to shame by his idols, for his images are false, false, and there is no breath in them. They are worthless, a work of delusion. At the time of their punishment, they shall perish. Not like these is he who is the portion of Jacob, for he is the one who formed all things, and Israel is the tribe of his inheritance. The Lord of hosts is his name. Okay, so first of all, against Babylon and then in favor of Jacob, God is going to use the king of the Medes, which would be the king of Persia, which I think is Xerxes, I want to say. Might be wrong about that one. To destroy Babylon. And so it, we've got this kind of weird just time of delay going on from God's perspective. And we talked about this a little bit, I think it was in the last devotion, this time of delay where God is delaying his judgment and the people making this wrong connection between it. And, and that that being one of the dangers of God delaying his punishment, that the people think the wrong thing brought them here. Anyway, God destroyed his own temple. God raised up the Babylonians, brought them to Jerusalem, gave them victory over Jerusalem, caused them to um, spoil the spoils of war, plunder, that's the word I want, plunder his temple, take everything out. We're going to see that in the next chapter. We'll talk about the last chapter of Jeremiah. Gives us a good summary. Completely plunder his temple, uh, destroy it, basically burn it to the ground, knock it down, and that's sort of a crazy thing for us to think God God did that. Like God destroyed his own temple. But that wasn't the end of it. That is the vengeance of the Lord, the vengeance for his temple. So you, Babylon, who I raised up and who I brought to destroy my own temple, you broke one building. They kind of wrecked the rest of the city too, but we're going to focus on the one building. Me, now, I'm going to destroy your whole empire. So one building for your whole empire. Like the vengeance of God is, is kind of infinitely greater than, I'll say, anything that can be done to him. Right? God would cause his own temple to be destroyed to make a point for the sake of his people. And then as, and now we can say punishment, as punishment for the Babylonians coming in and destroying God's temple, God destroys all of them, their, their whole way of life and their whole being. And today, there is no nation of Babylon, right? That's, that's kind of what one of the things that I really like about looking at these historic empires. God did make a full end of them. There's no nation of Persia today, by the way. There's no nation of Assyria. There is a Syria, but it's different than the Syria in the Bible. There's no Philistia. Uh, there's no Edom or Ammon or any. God made a full end of all of them. And that's the cool thing to see. They're not countries anymore. They're not on the map. 
they're gone. Their civilization, their way of life, all their stuff is just done. Right? God destroyed Babylon. Just psh, gone. Okay. Now, what I like, verses 15 through 19, have a very Jobian feel to them. So when God is finally talking to Job, at the end of that book, Job 38 through 40, 41, there's a lot of this same language going on, right? Uh, stretched out the heavens, especially this one. He makes lightning for the rain, brings forth the wind from his storehouses. At that point in Job, God is phrasing them as questions like, Aren't you the guy, Job? Aren't you the guy who brings the wind out of its storehouse? Aren't you the guy who makes lightning for the rain? And them all being rhetorical questions for the sake of Job saying, oh yeah, I guess that's not me. But here, God is showing his power in relation to, at the time this is spoken, well, lots of phrases, clauses in this sentence. <laughs> Let me back up and rephrase that thought so it's hopefully a little, little more clear. When God is speaking these words, Babylon is a mighty empire. And at that point, God is saying, I am mightier than you, Babylon. I'm the one who made all of this stuff. So I can do with it whatever I want. But again, he works for the sake of his people. And he continues to guard and protect his people arranging all of these events, the Babylonian Empire, the Persian Empire, uh, eventually the Roman Empire, all of these things for the sake of his people. Like God is doing, the whole earth exists to serve God's people. That's, that's a wonderful thought. God has made these things for your benefit, to provide for you, to serve you, to give you what you need. What you need, he continues uh, to keep these things going, to provide for you. He arranges the nations of the world and all of these things for his people, for your sake. And God can work through, I'll say it again because I like saying it, God can work through even the most wicked and godless governments to accomplish what he wants. And in the midst of all this judgment language, we've got these little pieces of, I'm here to protect you. I'm here for your benefit. I am a mighty God, he says. I am also the God who loves you. And so I'm here to do what you need. Okay, I guess let's pray. Dear Lord God, thank you for making us your people. Thank you for guarding and protecting us. Help us to look to you in every time of need. Help us to look to you as the events of this world seem chaotic and out of control, knowing that you have a plan. And help us to live in faith towards that plan. We pray this in the name of Jesus. Amen. Okay, so uh, we have one more devotion in the book of Jeremiah. And it is sort of a wrap-up. I wanted to do kind of a wrap-up of the book. I might do an extra wrap-up, sort of a what have we learned kind of thing, just to help make everything all nice and tied up with a neat little bow. Chapter 52, the next chapter, uh, our next devotion, is going to give us a summary of the siege of Jerusalem and the exile and all this stuff. So it's going to give us kind of historically a nice wrap-up. I also want to have thematically, theologically, kind of what happened in this book. What did this book show us about God? Not just the things that happened in it, but what do these events tell us about God? So we might, we might have, that might be the same video. That might be two different videos. We'll kind of see how, how long I get in the next devotion. But anyway, our time in Jeremiah is winding to a close. So I hope that this has been beneficial to you. I hope that you have learned things about God, and I hope that you come back next time. God's peace be with you, 
I will see you then.